while uh, Mike is helping me out, uh, uh, let me just say that uh, this paper has a, a rather unusual history, even, uh, even for me, and give, even given my many years of interest in uh, the economics. There we are. Religion control L probably gives you a full screen. Bingo. Um, as you can see, um, or could a second ago, uh, this is co-authored work with uh, Colleen Haight and uh, Jared Rubin. Jared, uh, I'm proud to say, is now my uh, colleague at uh, Chapman University, having just joined us from Cal State Fullerton. Uh, Colleen has been uh, is a uh, PhD uh, from George Mason University, one of my former <laughs> students, uh, who uh, uh, now is uh, has been wor uh, working at uh, San Jose State uh, for for several years. And this paper has a long history, uh, starting with a. Uh, a Liberty Fund conference that I went to on Plutarch's Moralia and uh, was struck when we were reading uh, some of Plutarch's essays. Plutarch, by the way, was among other things the, uh, uh, the priest of Delphi uh, long past its heyday in 200 or so in the, the 100s uh, AD. Uh, and uh, some essays about, about um, Delphi that I found quite striking, in part because of their cynicism and because of the sort of implied political economy perspective uh, that's there. And uh, I'll, I'll spare you the discussion of, of Plutarch, just but I will only say that it got me started thinking about Delphi in a new way and thinking about ways in which uh, public choice economics, political economy, and the economics of religion might all have something to say about this very, very ancient religious institution and whether in the process we might learn something more uh, you know, from it about, about the economics of religion today. Uh, and, and my basic, uh, this, there are of course no photographs of the priestess of Delphi uh, or uh, petitioners. This is some, uh, I think, 19th century image of uh, uh, you know, somebody's uh, reconstruction of the, the process whereby uh, a priestess known as the Pythia would be consulted. There, was, there seemed to have been uh, vapors, or she was sitting above a crevice. Uh, whether or not these vapors produced hallucinogenic gas is, is really not for this conversation, uh, and I think uh, this leads people. But in any case, petitioners, uh, great and small, but especially great, would come to Delphi and uh, pronouncements over extraordinary important events, uh, treaties, uh, uh, determinations of whether or not to go to war, uh, policies, new constitutions for the city-states of places like Athens and Sparta. These were all, uh, or many of them all, decided at Delphi, uh, and, the, uh, and this institution remained extremely powerful, as far as we can tell, for something like 400 years. How it is? Well, that's the story I want to talk about today. Uh, and in the process, I want to, come, I want to uh, make several points. Uh, more general than anything I happen to have written right here uh, is the point that I think modern day methods of, ec of standard economics as applied to what we call sometimes called non-market behavior and in particular the methods that have been applied to the economics of religion uh, in uh, the last couple of decades seem to do remarkably well when applied to cultures that are way outside of the boundary of what we think of as modern. In fact, not just uh, not modern in, in the narrow sense, but truly pre-modern economies. So ancient Greece, and I'll talk a little bit about ancient Israel as well. Uh, the results don't just replicate what we've seen, but extend them. And in particular, I'll, I'll, I'll argue that they give us an idea of a different kind of, of equilibrium, a different kind of religious market that's been overlooked in the standard literature. And they highlight how religious uh, institutions can be tremendously powerful in solving social problems that uh, are otherwise difficult to solve, in particular problems of coordination and information sharing. Um, and I'll say more about that as we go. Uh, by way of background, those of us who've worked in the economics of religion are all familiar with uh, Adam Smith's uh, small in size, 20, 30 pages, but very large in uh, import. Adam Smith's contribution to the study of religion, which appears in the fifth book of The Wealth of Nations. And I've quoted here just one uh, 
of his statements in which he's thinking about contrasting the incentives of religious leaders or teachers in the case where they depend on contributions or instead on support from the government. And he points out that their exertion, their zeal, their industry, their, you know, uh, their incentives are much likely greater when they are paid by volunteers, when they're <coughs> effectively participating in, in the market economy, as opposed to being political actors. And he notes that over time, this means that, rather ironically, state churches, churches of new religions have always had considerable advantage in attacking ancient and established systems, established meaning here, state-run or state finances churches, those that enjoy the power and the support of the state tend to erode and weaken from the inside because the clergy, as he says in this wonderful phrase, reposing themselves upon their benefices, had neglected to keep up the fervor of the faith and the devotion of the great body of the people. When, it, when push comes to shove, they're in no position to, uh, to fight off the upstarts. And, and we see this throughout history. Uh, the result of this kind of thinking and, and the chapters that Adam Smith uh, wrote on it in subsequent work is basically a twofold theory of religious markets, contrasting uh, uh, state sponsored religion, what we'll glibly call just religious monopoly, but keeping in mind that, that it's not a natural monopoly as far as we can tell, but rather through the, the uh, coercive power of the state. European style, in, historically, uh, religious monopoly versus American style free-for-alls religious competition. And those contrasts pervade a lot of modern work on the economics of religion. They've had a lot of impact on uh, religious history and sociology of religion, a lot of fields other than economics. We're claiming, and I can say we because one of my co-authors, co Jared, is right there uh, at the back row uh, keeping track of my errors, at waiting to correct my game theory, uh, we're claiming that we've overlooked in the literature uh, an important alternative equilibrium, which we call the neutral nexus. Uh, and this nexus, which is neither best thought of as a free market or a uh, monopoly, and can promote cooperation, innovation, exchange, especially where markets are weak and power is fragmented. And, the, and then Delphi, not surprisingly, is, is going to be my main example. Uh, more importantly, it's Delphi is not unique. Uh, in, in ancient Greece, what you had, in fact, is a whole network of shrines and sanctuaries that substituted for uh, not, just the, not just the state churches or the free churches that we're familiar with or their counterparts, but indeed, uh, it's been argued by uh, a good many economic uh, uh, specialist in ancient Greek history and even some economic historians that the sanctuaries and shrines substituted for the invisible hand of modern markets, that we were truly in a pre-market situation without uh, standard market methods of coordination. And I'll point out with the power is fragmented as it was, we're also in a situation that does not look anything like the traditional ancient empires. Uh, these, these networks of shrines and Delphi in particular uh, produced stronger shared identity, reduced conflict, created more cooperation, enhanced ex exchange. Uh, and it's not just Delphi, although it seems by far the best example. I'm going to argue that a similar story exists in part of the history of ancient Israel in the period known as the period of the judges before Israel, uh, while, while before Israel becomes a kingdom while they are still, uh, their life is still dominated by by independent tribes. Other examples of the same kind of process that I'll be talking about uh, is seen in divination practices in a wide range of so-called primitive cultures and in some institutions that uh, are quite modern and uh, quite with us, including, uh, I can't help but taking some swipes, uh, uh, in the uh, Supreme Court and our, indeed our entire court system. Um, so the game plan here is to talk about this generalized theory of religious markets, apply it to ancient Greece, ancient Israel, say a little bit about its application in other eras, give you a, a very quick, very quick overview of the formal foundation, a simple game theory model that we employed uh, more as proof of concept than, uh, than anything else, uh, identify the, the three equilibria that emerge in that model and in particular show that they map on to what has traditionally been called religious monopoly, religious competition, 
and what has been traditionally overlooked, this neutral nexus, and point out one of the most striking paradoxes or features of the nexus is that it seems to derive its power from weakness, uh, its authority from being marginal uh, in power uh, and, and often marginal in location. Uh, and we'll extend this in, in, some, in various ways. And as I say here, the bottom line is a fundamentally you know, richer theory of religious markets and a better understanding, I think, especially appropriate to this conference, of how uh, religious institutions can help to sustain norms, coordination, economic activity, political, a whole range of, of very important things. Uh, let me say a few things about uh, about sacred places. Uh, and uh, I should note that uh, this paper began uh, in, in part, as I say, because of Plutarch's Moralia. The other piece was that I was uh, funded by the Templeton Foundation, uh, one of several people funded in an initiative that they called their Spiritual Capital Initiative. Uh, what they meant by that was an extension of the idea of human capital uh, that economists are well familiar with. Uh, I found myself in, you know, involved and, and grateful, no doubt, for their support, but also sometimes frustrated by what I thought was an overly narrow notion of capital. And partly, uh, you know, to satisfy my own frustration, I started playing word games of what, what could you, you know, what other ways could you connect the words spiritual and capital. Spiritual capitals came up pretty quickly and it got me thinking, literally, uh, seriously, about, well, you know, wh what can we say? Oh, great. Uh, without pulling the wires out. Have I just turned off? Yeah. What can we say about, thank you, Mike. Uh, um, there's always somebody just geeky enough to get, get us back online. When geeky? I, yeah, I know. I, I'd insult you even as I thanked you. I've been called worse. Uh, what can we say, you know, what can we say about the location, the history of, of Loc of places that could be thought of capitals of, of, of a spiritual cosmos. So we we get, get to start all over, huh? It's the batteries. Oh, yeah. Cool. It's plugged in. It said it wasn't plugged in before you left. Uh -huh. All right. Well, this gives me a chance to, since so we're talking about religion, I might as well preach. And thankfully, I have my hard copy here. Uh, um, there's a couple of, uh, I think, important things to keep in mind when you're, when you're uh, thinking about the location, the, the geography of the sacred. The first is that people seem to have this amazing capacity to invest any area with sacred significance. Uh, the world is positively littered with uh, sacred places and objects and rituals. And you know, for every uh, holy hilltop, that you know find is on a, uh, a well-defended you know boulder that's not that's near the heavens and not too far from a near you know a nearby road and uh, for every such uh, you know apparently obvious candidate for spirit you know spiritual location there's a blessed boulder in a hidden vale not far you know close to anything you name it people can find ways to invest it with religious meaning. Uh, John, the surface suggests we're in trouble when it comes to uh, talking about the geography of the sacred. Um, on the other hand, um, and what gets us beyond this, is that the sacred is a social construct. Uh, people don't, you know, they, people get ideas about you know, inspiration, but the, but the ideas that take hold, take root, and make a difference are those that end up being shared, reinforced through shared beliefs and actions and the creation of institutions. Uh, there, there's definitely, uh, it's, it's scarcely important, there's scarcely any religion or, or even I, th I would say spirituality, uh, uh, you know, sacred notions that are worth talking about that haven't become social phenomena. Uh, and on the other hand, the sacred is socially quite important and powerful because it helps to sustain, and, and uh, as Peter Berger pointed out many, many years ago, social reality. The institutions, identity, authority, exchange, uh, all of these can be better sa stabilized and strengthened with, uh, with some sense of the sacred. Uh, and so marriages of the sacred and the secular are common, especially where economic and political institutions are weak or fragmented. It's there that you see uh, the sacred really do. I'll take care of it from there. Thank you very much. 
Uh, do you know what the problem is? Are we just, is it, it power? It looked like there was a switch off. Okay. Uh, so this wasn't me getting no. carried away. It was, all right, so. God is angry with you. Guys, <laughs> I, uh, it, it's entirely possible. And given this paper, the problem is I can't even figure out which God is angry with me. <laughs> um, okay. And the angry God is not moving very fast from one, let's see. I dare. Yeah. You work, I talk. Uh, I'm really sorry to do this to you. Um, oh, I'm sorry this happened. Okay. Um, so let me talk briefly about the uh, the game, the the formal model that we created. As I say, mostly as proof of concept. Now it works for you. Uh, okay. Now there we go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, excuse me. Yeah, there we are. All right, imagine a setting in which you've got N independent, I'll call them polities. You can think of them as little city states, uh, communities. Uh, this operates at, at, at essentially any level of aggregation. Each of these polities will uh, has a domain, a ruler. Uh, think of it as a political authority. It doesn't really matter what the, what the type of authority is. Could be a tribal council, but let's just you know think of it as a king. Each domain di has a has one or more sacred spaces. Call it si. Might as well think of it as one, uh, whether for historical reasons or obviously constructed. Uh, there are other sacred spaces. We'll call them sn one plus and so on that are in independent locations, often no man's land, beyond the domain of any ruler. And this marriage I was talking about is especially important for rulers. Sacred places can enhance a ruler's power by justifying actions, broadening support, undermining opposition, so forth. Uh, but citizens aren't stupid about this, okay? They can be awed by the temple and awed by the fact or impressed that the temple is located right next to uh, the palace. And they can be somewhat impressed by the fact that uh, the pope or, or, you know, or, or the archbishop uh, preaches sermons on God's uh, favor for the, the king or the kings, but they, you know, they're, not, they're not totally con. Citizens realize that rulers seek to manipulate the sacred and that rulers can more manipulate places that are inside his own domain. Uh, and so there's a cost to, to in effect, brainwashing or, or uh, uh, more uh, subtle word would be socializing people. Uh, rulers, uh, there's a cost to uh, impressing them with uh, the <coughs> legitimacy that you gain from, uh, from in effect, co-opting a, a sacred place. A ruler gains more legitimacy if the sacred places within his domain are visited by more outside rulers. And one way of thinking about this is simply that if, the, if, if your populace, if your citizens are looking for evidence that this sacred space is real and it's not just because you, the ruler, are financing it, well, the fact that other people are making pilgrimages there, that other rulers are, are you know, bowing there, well, that, that, look, that begins to make it look more impressive, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, you, you said this like probably, but are all these places equally sacred to everybody? Uh, the basic idea here is, uh, I, I think that the best way to answer that is, you, is that in the simplest version of the model, which I'll say a word about, uh, yeah, they're all, they're all equally sacred because they're functioning like a shelling coordination. They're, they're just useful insofar as we happen to all go there. Uh, once you introduce, uh, once you introduce rulers versus citizens, uh, you might say that each ruler views his own location as more sacred. I think a better way to say it is all the locations are equally good candidates for sacredness. Our model doesn't distinguish between places that are inherently more compelling, but rather we think of how compelling a place is as a function of how many other how many people are are utilizing it? Okay, and in particular in this model, uh, how compelling a, a place is is a function of how many other how many rulers and citizens outside a domain are using it. So it's a pretty simple-minded note model. One way of thinking about it is well, as I said, the world is littered with the sacred. We're just going to focus on that small subset that for whatever reasons have attained a certain amount of face legitimacy. And so among those, they're all, you know, we're thinking that at least one place inside each domain is a good candidate 
for, uh, for you know, a, a spiritual capital. And in, uh, and think it, maybe J's get clipped here, but it was S, I, S, J. These are different spaces in ruler's eyes <laughs> domain. S, I is the sacred place there. S, J is the location inside ruler J's domain. N plus K, these are, this is a location that's outside anybody's domain. And the kind of payoff matrix we envision is one that works like this. If, uh, imagine that on, on the horizontal side, we've got ruler J and his perspective on the vertical ruler I. Uh, uh, I loves it if he can get uh, J to, let's see, uh, help me out here if I've got this wrong here. Um, if, I think I may have reversed this some, if ruler I gets people to go in sacred space A and ruler J goes there as well, he, J tends to lose, I think this should be a J and this and I actually, J loses some power, I gains it because people are worshiping in his location including an outside ruler. Uh, if the situation is reversed, uh, if we end up in J's domain, I ends up in J's domain, J is, is happier, he gets three. I is, loses because he's in effect, effectively giving over power and legitimacy to somebody else. They're both in pretty good shape if they find some independent location. This looks like a, a shelling style coordination. The worst thing is if J ends up in I's location, I ends up in J's location, this is never going to be uh, an equilibrium. Uh, and over here, this represents each of them and their populations worshiping within their own domain. That's a good example of why I don't always find game theory charts all that uh, illuminating. It's uh, sometimes easier to just switch to words here. Uh, not these words, for heaven's sakes. Uh, this is the formal model. I'm going to just skip over on the assumption that you believe that you, me that we haven't uh, made up made hash of this, and I'll just point out some of the elements here that we think we're thinking in terms of perspective of rulers, citizens just kind of doing uh, what they're paid off to do. Uh, the rulers earn a, a payoff, which I'm calling an inside payoff, when they worship in their own location. An outside payoff if they worship in some other location. There's a cost of getting compliance among the city citizens, no matter what. Uh, the number of outside rulers, people who come into your location, is of concern to you. You gain from that. And you gain legitimacy, this L function, uh, depending on, well, basically, the number of outsiders who come to your location. You also get to, in effect, tax people, uh, tax the rulers. Uh, a small tribute uh, if they come to your location. And so your payoff, depending on whether you end up worshiping inside your own location or inside here or outside there, it looks something like this. And what you get, here's the important point, is a fairly sensible set of equilibria. And this exhausts the possibilities in a simple one period model, uh, which we describe in more detail in our paper. There's one possibility we call local dominance. Everybody worships in their own separate domain. So, uh, you know, so it, all the Spartans worship at the most sacred shrine of Sparta and, the, and that's, that, you know, particular location has a certain sort of quid pro quo going with, uh, with the rulers of Sparta. Same story in Athens, same story in any other Greek city-state. Everybody operates separately for the purposes of religion and the religious economy. We've got essentially a whole series of religious monopolies. Another possibility is, in, you know, partitioning into local religious monopolies. Another possibility is that we have what we'll call global dominance. Everybody ends up in one, in the domain, worshiping at one sacred location. This is more akin to, you know, Rome at the heyday of its power. Uh, and you have one generally acknowledged religious uh, place that's more sacred than anywhere else, that it's within the domain of one dominant ruler. Everybody goes there. Free market religion, the American model, so to speak, is the case where everybody opts out, or the, the rulers kind of say, we're not going to get involved in this. We, the cost of compliance is too high, or it's, you know, for whatever reason, citizens can do what they want. And so the sacred market separates itself from the political market altogether. 
The neutral nexus, in the case that I want to talk about most, is the one in which everybody ends up at an independent location, Sn plus k, someplace outside of all the domains. The attractiveness of the independent location is clear enough if you just, as I say, think about shelling style uh, uh, coordination. I'm assuming you're all kind of familiar with the story where a couple of people uh, know they're supposed to meet together uh, in New York City on a given day, uh, but they seem to have lost track of when they're going to meet and where. Now I mentioned this problem because it's a true classic. Uh, and behind it, it comes an idea that uh, you know made it motivate a lot of game theory. Uh, but when you, I should also mention that if you if you give this idea to any student today, they say, oh, that's simple. Just call them on their cell phone. And if they if you don't have their cell phone, well, then you know post a message on Facebook and so on. It talks. It's a good example of how technology undermines good stories. Uh, but uh, prior to that, it was you know it was just barely possible that you could have have, have arrived with such a little plan. And it, tur it turns out, of the millions, perhaps even billions of places you might conceivably meet, uh, people quickly realize that there are only a few really good candidates. Outsiders from New York, people who don't know New York City have a tendency to say things like, we'll meet at the Statue of Liberty, we'll meet on top of uh, the Empire State Building. New York, uh, we'll, meet in uh, we'll meet at uh, uh, Times Square. New York natives know that that's kind of stupid because why pay the money to get up to the top of the, uh, of the Empire State Building or why muddle around when there are thousands of other people uh, at, uh, you know, on, on uh, Times Square. Meet at 12 noon under the clock at Grand Central Station. This was, and I don't know what to call, but, but Shelling sort of went around asking people, this was the overwhelming response. And, and, you know, the point is that uh, you could get tremendous gains from coordination by finding some, you know, some shared location. It didn't matter what it was as long as you locked onto it. Once you did lock onto it, it uh, had a strong tendency to continue. And from the standpoint of religion, this neutral nexus operates this way. It's a kind of shelling style equilibrium. Except it does. Uh, except we're embedding this now in a context where you're not talking about just two or three or a hundred equal players. We're talking about players, some of whom the rulers have powerful incentives, and the others are just sort of, you know, sheep going along. Uh, and what I want to do is is now sort of walk you through the, the history of why I think certain equilibria of these three show up sometimes and not others. Okay, so I'll get around to the neutral nexus soon enough, but let's start with the standard case. Established churches, <laughs> at least in the West, uh, are, are truly standard history. Uh, powerful rulers gain more from spiritual dominance uh, than, than weak rulers, uh, you know, uh, generally speaking. There's, and, and they find it to their, you know, there's a, there's a kind of quid pro quo, a marriage of special interest. Adam Smith talks about this, that gets established over time as one ruler identifies one religious authority and the two get linked together. The religious authority sacralizes, sanctifies, legitimates the, the political authority's power. The political authority uh, squashes the competition and <laughs> use a lot, uses uh, secular resources to strengthen the position of the church. Uh, so you get this marriage of sacred and secular, very common. Uh, just kind of summarize some basic you know, propositions about their right in front of you. Uh, and, and, and this indeed describes the kind of history of, of what happens, uh, you know, whether it's Rome or, uh, or Byzantium, uh, or the Eastern Church, um, the Orthodox Church, or uh, you know, the, the, sort of the exception that proves the rule, uh, King Henry, when he becomes sufficiently powerful, uh, decides you know, he's, not, he's going to have, create his own sacred capital and his own church. Um, and you see this, you know, repeatedly throughout history. You see it in 19th century uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, and there, in fact, is some of my list. You see it in ancient Egypt. You see it in biblical Jerusalem, but not all periods of Israel's history. Uh, and many more. And I've just summarized here in words uh, the sort of things I've been saying. Uh, there are problems, as I note at the bottom. Even the Catholic Church, at the height of its secular uh, authority, was surrounded on all sides by heresy. Uh, there always were threats of schism. Uh, they had to deal with, you know, witchcraft and 
creating a powerful and, and, you know, uh, and effective religious monopoly turns out to be actually quite hard for many of the reasons that I mentioned, including the ones that Adam Smith mentioned uh, in that quote, that uh, uh, state support, uh, as we know in public choice theory, breeds inefficiency. Um, this is my, in lieu of, you know, uh, in lieu of more math, uh, this is my diagram of, of uh, what I'm calling the, uh, the, new, the uh, established church uh, equilibrium. You've got a single religious authority donated, de designated by that cross up there, and a single political authority, a dominant political authority, and they've linked together in, in location uh, and you know, in purpose, and all the citizens, little white dots, are worshiping one uh, it, you know, at, the, at, at that one place, and uh, other religions might be present, no problem, they just get gunned down by the secular authorities. So, uh, you know, heresy is, is by definition uh, suppressed, illegal, and uh, this is sort of the standard model that most people carry around in their heads, maybe without the little red X's, uh, when they think about a religious market. Uh, and, and the danger, frankly, is to misinterpret even, even Catholicism at uh, its most uh, monopolistic moments, definitely much of history. Uh, a striking alternative is the United States. And uh, the United States ends up at, uh, starts at what we would call this class one uh, religious monopoly in which uh, equal agreement, which have 13 independent colonies, religiously diverse, most of them, not all, but most of them uh, have state religions, uh, Angle, you know, the Anglican or, or, or uh, uh, Ch the Church of England in Virginia, Catholicism in what, Maryland, uh, help me out here, uh, Congregationalism up in Massachusetts and so on. There are state churches almost everywhere. When, and they, when the colonies form a single union, uh, a shared neutral nexus is essentially impossible because they can't agree on a single location. You know, Virginia is not going to say, well, we'll make Boston our, our sacred, our location of sacred authority. We'll all become congregationalists. Uh, the the uh, Constitution actually anticipates, and, and there's the key phrase, the disestablishment, the establishment phrase, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. They're basically envisioning a, uh, what, what I in my list here call a class zero equilibrium. We're not going to have a single religious authority. Rather, each subunit has its own religious authority. And, and those of you who aren't, you know, is, is up to speed on this, uh, it's very important to understand that historically, the First Amendment did not prohibit uh, state uh, established churches. It only prohibited a federal level establishment. Uh, there were established churches in many of the colonies. They persisted for decades in the states. It was, I think, 1840 before the last of them, Massachusetts, officially disestablished congregationalism. And those established churches were able to tax and exercise authority and limit the actions of other churches and their own, and their own population for a long time. This equilibrium, which the Constitution envisioned, unravels over time. And it basically unravels because there's no good economic reason to keep it going. Uh, we've got interstate migration, uh, a lot of new denominations being born. And I think especially in a fundamental political sense, we didn't need it. The, uh, the institutions of, of the American democracy, uh, economic and political, worked so well that it really didn't need this marriage uh, of uh, religious institutions, at least in my way of thinking about it. In any case, soon enough, the U.S. becomes a true religious free, from, free for all, like the, you know, basically the world's first laissez-faire religious market. And you can kind of ask yourselves, what, you know, when did these kind of things arise? What happens? Uh, well, the benefits of religious establishment decrease as secular support for political and economic institutions increase, so you don't need them so much. Uh, the costs of establishment are, are higher when, when you've got a population that's more diverse and mobile, you know, shoehorning them all into one, into one religion with one you know, sacred capital gets harder and harder. Uh, yeah, secular control over the sacred... Uh, this is the, you know, this is my sort of schematic of the American scheme. The, se uh, the religion, religious domain is, is distinct from, separate from, 
the sacred, I mean, the, uh, the secular domain, so king, you know, political authority is out there in, an, in another domain. People get to worship at whatever religion they want, or like those blue dots, worship nowhere at all. Uh, and those of us who've studied religious markets and have thought along the lines of Adam Smith on, on free markets note that not only do you get people worshiping in multiple locations, multiple firms, but you get the benefits of competition, which is to say more diversity, more worship, uh, so the, the argument that uh, has been uh, made and uh, I think largely sustained in economics of religion is that religious freedom, free religious markets, end up producing not just more diversity, uh, but uh, also higher levels of religious mobility. All right. The overlooked equilibrium, as I've said, is the story of, of Greece and uh, not just Greece. Central base, the central idea here is you, you have numerous autonomous polities sharing a common culture, benefiting from trade, communication, and mutual defense, or at least potentially benefiting from those things, but uh, for whatever reason, not under the control of, a, of, you know, of, of an empire. Uh, the danger here is that you end up with a kind of multi-person's prisoner's dilemma of non-stop conflict, and believe me, this is a very good description of the city-states of ancient Greece. Numerous, uh, I used to think it was just a handful of Sparta, you know, Athens, and then my knowledge sort of begun to, to run out. Uh, Greece emerges from the so-called Greek Dark Ages in the ninth century with essentially every, every community, every clan entirely independent and at war with all the others, okay? Uh, a poor solution in this environment is for every one of these little communities to have its own religious system, the, uh, what I was calling a class zero equilibrium. A better solution is this neutral nexus. It's more likely when the polities are indeed, as the archaeologists call them, peer polities, relatively equal in strength, similar in size, uh, where they already share a similar culture, language, and so forth, uh, you know, then, then this is natural. Uh, and these are my, my just statements of when this is most likely to happen. And what I really want to point out is that it happens in the political world, too. We chose Washington, D.C. for our capital, as uh, most of you know, precisely because it wasn't Virginia, Philadelphia, that is, or New York. Uh, it was, in fact, a, uh, a uh, malaria-infested swamp, uh, but it had the advantage of being a kind of political no-man's land. Milton Friedman also points out that it ha all had the advantage of having such lousy weather that, got, that it wasn't until they uh, instituted uh, air conditioning in the early 1900s that, that Congress ran all through the year. As he thought that was the worst thing that ever happened to politics in America. Uh, that's neither here nor there. The point is, Washington, D.C. was, in fact, a neutral nexus equilibrium. If you've been to Australia, you know that Canberra is likewise uh, a sort of synthetic city created precisely because it's not Sydney, and it's not, uh, what's the other Melbourne. name? Melbourne, thank you. Uh, Ottawa, Canada is almost precisely midway between Toronto and Montreal. This happens over and over again, and, and my you know, visual, visual image of this is here. You know, lots of separate polities, little populations, some relatively unoccupied locations. What are you going to do? Build yourself a temple uh, that's in no man's land, and everybody shares it. How they're going to share it, I'll say a little more in a moment. Uh, but that's sort of, you know, the image. It's quite distinct from the other two markets that we've been talking about, market structures. Delphi fits this almost perfectly. And keep in mind, we're talking about coordination. If ever there was a culture in need of coordination, it's ancient Greece, all of these separate warring factions. Geography more or less dictates that for the time being it was going to be that way. Hills, no great uh, rivers. Uh, it, it, was, it was difficult, even if you became quite powerful in one location or valley, to extend that power elsewhere. Uh, Pre-modern economy that, uh, I couldn't quite believe this until I read the historians over and over again, really doesn't have the invisible hand of modern exchange. Uh, under, so, so you know, how do these people, here's the puzzle. How does this scattered group of people, pre-modern economy, without any of the benefits of things that we would normally associate with coordination, and economic advance uh, and political authority, how do they end up producing 
the, uh, you know, the greatest body of poetry, drama, sculpture, architecture, literature, philosophy, political theory, science, mathematics, technology, warcraft even, uh, uh, of the whole ancient world. And they do it all in just a few hundred years. Well, you know, I wish I could say, and here I have the secret. Uh, I will say that insofar as there is a secret, it seems to be in no small part the network that the networks uh, of communication, coordination, and exchange that were created and sustained through Greek religion, Greek shrines, temples, and in particular, the main temples uh, of Delphi uh, and Olympia, and there's a couple of others I, whose names I forget. Um, and this, the historians seem to be pretty unanimous on this, even though they, don't, they can't quite describe the mechanism. I think uh, the paper I've, we're, we're talking about today comes a little closer to helping us understand the mechanism. Uh, this much is certain. There's a great deal of coordination, diffusion of information, imitation, uh, and relatively limited warfare, by no means a cessation of hostilities, but relatively limited warfare among these competing city-states over this so-called golden age of ancient Greece. And it certainly isn't predicated on modern communication technologies or modern political systems or anything remotely like a modern economy. Uh, and most goods and services, I have to emphasize, are not being produced in exchange for money or normal profits. They're being produced in a traditional economy, which means that, uh, basically mutual obligations. You're, you're performing traditional functions over and over again. And yet, as I say, look at that list. It's, you know, we all were raised with this. It's, it's, it's true. <laughs> Uh, I mean, by the time these guys were done, they hadn't just made really great, you know, uh, uh, they hadn't just great, made great plays and uh, great sculptures and great pots. They also took over the world. They had, you know, military warcraft, which allowed a small body of people to beat uh, the greatest armies uh, of the world, armies that were, you know, 100 times larger. Uh, if you look at the geography of ancient Greece, what, you, what is striking with regard to Delphi is it's no man's land. Athens, Corinth, Sparta, and go through the list of major cities. It's understandable why they are where they are. They tend to be close to waterways. They tend to be along you know, rivers or something. You can understand uh, why the main cities are there. Delphi is a no man's land. And despite what this, you know, the, the sort of semi-sacred story that Delphi was the navel of the universe and had ancient religious significance, no, we can't find any evidence of cultic activity in Delphi prior to the 8th century. And then it skyrockets in the 7th and the 6th, and then collapses again, I'll show you, a few hundred years later. No evidence that Delphi owes its authority from just some ancient kind of credibility. Okay? Uh, I'm muted. I don't need to, I've sort of said all of this already. What I wanted to, what I want to point out is this line here. There are Pan-Hellenic sanctuaries, and, and sanctuaries, the word means what you might think it means. These were places where the Greeks would put down their arms, where they would all agree they were not going to fight, uh, which was normally what you did, uh, uh, during periods of uh, sometimes uh, you know, games, uh, like the Olympic Games, uh, certain times of the year, certain years out of a cycle of four. Uh, and these were all remote areas. Delphi just isn't strategically important. It never was a big town. Uh, when does Delphi become really powerful? Interestingly, it becomes powerful when it not only is a, a small town, uh, when even local control is taken away. There's a period where a group called the Amphictomy, which is a sort of council of representatives from different tribes, uh, take joint control of Delphi, uh, <coughs> I suppose, to, to uh, limit favoritism. Net effect is that oracular divination skyrockets. In fact, the oracle becomes really important, whereas it had not been so much so in 700 and 800. Uh, it, Delphi also becomes economically quite important, not as a place where resources are produced, but where they are banked. Okay? Uh, petitions are primarily of a political nature, and they're hugely important. They're things like legal code decisions, wars, boundary disputes, whether we're going to found a new colony, uh, what the form of our constitution is going to take. It functioned as a kind of divine court of appeals. And as uh, Snodgrass, who seems to be one of the leading uh, 
archaeologists and anthropologists who, uh, of this says it looks like you know Delphi is acting like a major clearinghouse, central clearinghouse for information. Um, now, if you think about information exchange around, among numerous polities, yeah, uh, you immediately become aware of how serious the problem is when you don't have a coordinating mechanism like, uh, like money. Uh, you've got all of these people, n of them, in one location. Well, it looks complicated, but imagine that they all have to operate bilaterally. It's that kind of thing. You, know, you can do the math. It's overwhelming when you've got 1,000 Greek city-states or what did I say, even 200 Greek city-states, you've got something close to 20,000 relations. Um, what happens if you track Delphi is that its power, and, and a fellow named Joseph Frontenot has painstakingly looked at all of Delphi's, in, the inquiries that we can still track, characterize them, state inquiries, these are political inquiries, skyrocket during this period of independence, collapse later, I'll explain why, Religious inquiries likely sky, likewise skyrocket and collapse, but not quite so quickly. Domestic, it's when you, somebody comes and says, when would be a propitious time for me to plant grain? This goes on forever. Uh, the fall is ironically uh, Delphi being sort of a victim of its own success. There are sacred wars over control of Delphi, but when things get really bad <laughs> is when the wars all stop. When Philip of Macedon and then his son, Alexander uh, brings peace to Greece by way of empire. Delphi loses all of its significance. Philip doesn't need a central clearinghouse uh, for information. Uh, as in the, and when the Roman Empire takes over even more so, Delphi goes back to being a hinterland. No strategic significance. So the moment the Pure polity situation disappears, Delphi's power disappears. The moment we've got a single authority, we end up with what we're calling a class one equilibrium. Now, let me just say in a few last minutes that uh, what I found striking, Jared and my co-authors, uh, is that this seems to apply more broadly than you might imagine. And in particular, it doesn't seem to be something about polytheism or ancient Greece. I don't have time to go through it, but let me just sort of walk you very quickly through the note through Israel in the time of Judges. You've got ostensibly 12 tribes. People disagree how many and just how the history works. But Israel has, as with Greece, rough terrain, no, uh, especially down through the backbone, uh, no natural place for uh, a basis for an empire, a lot of independent uh, tribes, not just the 12 tribes of Israel, other, other tribes, all Canaanite tribes, all fighting with each other, fragmented, fiercely competitive, and so on. 12 tribes of Israel share a culture, share language, share you know, some kind of a history. This is a bad picture, sorry, but I was trying to give you an image of the key areas here. Israel forms a, a union, political union. The focal point is the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle. And it's located where? Through most of the period of, of the judges in Shiloh. And Shiloh has the distinction of being basically nowhere. No strategic significance, not an economically important place, not a militarily important place, not a major waterway, not a... Same story. And same kind of process insofar as it becomes a place where divination and decisions happen. Uh, when? political power asserts itself more strongly when you move away from pure polity to unity. In other words, when you get a king, first thing the king does, David, and then even more so Solomon, you move the, you move the religious authority right next to the political authority to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is uh, a fortress town, a major town. Uh, and the whole you know, religious dynamic changes as the political dynamic changes. And, and what I find really rather stunning is you've got two completely different re religious cultures, two uh, cultures that differ in all kinds of different ways, and yet they seem to establish uh, in the same kind of, of church-state relationship uh, for many hundreds of years, I think because they are in the same sort of fragmented situation. Uh, last thing, how does this done? Some people have argued, well, the oracle, you know, kind of cleverly acts as a go-between between competing powers and helps them negotiate. I want to tell you that I think that's bunk. 
And I want you to understand that, I, that's, I'm not just making this up, that there are a lot of people who've looked now at the history of the, of the oracle, and it would appear that most of the answers come quickly, and they're unambiguous, despite the poetry of stories you've probably heard. And my thinking is this, I want to, and, and is that if you are powerful political players, and cynical as hell, and surely the Greeks were, and you got a problem, you try to resolve it among the, between the two of you. The first way you try to resolve it maybe is through compromise. The second way is I've got a bigger sword. Only when all else fails do you go to a third party. And the last thing you want is a third party that can be bribed or can engage in rent seeking. If the third party is going away and so on, you get what corrupt, what corrupt judges do everywhere. They, they suck up all of the, uh, the surplus. Now what's a really good mechanism when you basically What's a really good decision mechanism when, when uh, there is a lot of surplus, but you, the two of you can't have exhausted all of your own ways of, of, of dividing it, either by relative power or anything else? Coin flips. I claim that the divination that worked so well at Delphi was basically random. And there's a good deal of evidence in anthropology that random divination plays a huge role throughout history in courts of appeal, basically, and final decisions when all other methods have been exhausted. And I'm going to end simply by saying, however crazy this sounds, by the way, coin flips have the obvious advantage that they're not subject to rent seeking. They have the obvious disadvantage that they are visibly random. If you can hide the randomness with, uh, or, or sort of give it a patina of the sacred, you get the best of both worlds. And I'm convinced that that's what goes on in a lot of divination across a lot of cultures. And my final claim is, I think this is what's going on in the Supreme Court most of the time. God help us if we end up with something radically different than a 5-4 split on the Supreme Court. God help us if we had a reliably conservative or liberal court. It is not a coincidence that the Supreme Court guys wander around wearing robes, uh, uh, you know, uttering, uh, I mean, and, and, you know, inhabiting a building that's, that's designed after a temple, uh, and act only as a final court of appeals on decisions that have already worked their way up through every other conceivable full system of arbitration. And if I'll go one last step, I'll say that Judge Kennedy, who is described as the protean, which means, you know, inscrutable and, and, uh, and variable, uh, judge in the middle, might, for all intents and purposes, be the pythia of old, you know, responding to hallucinogenic gases, and yes, no. I think this may be one of the keys to the stability of our, of our current system. <laughs>
the best way to explain to them how religion works or, uh, is to say, well, it's kind of like football, you know? Uh, so th there's, uh, the passions here are real. Uh, one would think that you'd see similar solutions, okay? If, if in fact there are, you know, if we're, this really, there is some social science and social forces at work, you, you'd expect to see uh, similar outcomes. I hadn't thought about the Patriots, but, uh, you know, uh, if you think about the history of teams, we had in periods with, and this is very much related to the transportation and especially communication technologies, there was, there was an era when we, when, you know, we had a lot of viable local teams. And now, you know, we, we operate at a much larger level, mostly metropolitan areas. Um, I, beyond that, all I can say is I see a lot of analogies. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if you can mine insights going back and forth, but I dare not go any farther. <laughs> I was thinking of exactly, I know what Michael was going to say, the NFL. You know. But interesting, it's a really different model because the NFL is a monopoly that's approved by, you know, uh, the federal government and regulated by the by Congress. And um, it, it has this incredible competitive element within it where you can choose any team you want to root for, except you can't choose a set of teams. Set of You're supposed to have a portfolio. <laughs> well, no, but the set of teams that are in the NFL are determined mm. by the commissioner, and the commissioner has the power by virtue of the legislature, I mean the uh, uh, federal uh, legislature. So you have a real monopoly, like the old, except it's not one church monopoly. It's kind of like the economist's best solution where you get to make it a monopoly, but you allow choice within it. Yeah. By the way, let me point out, just to take us back to, to real religion, uh, that we overstate the extent to which monopoly churches uh, and religions are monopolized. Uh, the Catholic Church in the height of its power was divided up into national churches as well as you know, had, had a lot of variation across local areas. Judaism has never been monopolized in remotely like uh, the, the manner of, uh, of Catholicism. Uh, likewise, Islam, and I think that the strength frankly, that uh, Islam and Judaism have had uh, over millennia has no small, is in no small part due to the internal competition. So there, is, there are some external limits to how, you know, who is and isn't, you know, doesn't count, but remarkably few. <laughs> and consensus, uh, uh, and perhaps some kind of system, you know, of, of, uh, you know, of shared uh, rent seeking, seems to drive this uh, quite effectively. A, a true monopoly, a true top-down system uh, with just one authority, uh, I think fails for a whole lot of reasons. Let's have one more quick question, and then we'll take a break. Um, so it seems novel here relative to other work is the emphasis on location. And it was that these religions have locations. Um, and that seemed very strong at the beginning and the end of your talk. I sort of lost it in the middle when you were applying it to the American case. And so I guess I want to know, you know, in the middle of your talk, I start thinking, well, you don't really need locations per se. You just need these and exceptions to be the religions. And you're playing some sort of matching game between the political powers and the religions. Um, so how important do you think religion, I can sorry, how important do you think location is? And do you want to go back and rethink your work on, you know, the American colonies and stuff? And is location going to be more important than it was before? Um, James, I think you're right that location is key to, to this analysis and it's where the analysis frankly began. I started asking how do you end up with sacred capitals and early on was just thinking about the traditional capital uh, that was, was obviously in the interest uh, of, of a monopoly uh, political power. Um, in principle, going back to the underlying game theory here, of, you know, and Schelling's notion of focal points, for example, uh, the power of that concept of focal points is that it, you can you can coordinate around just about anything. Um, the advantage of thinking about uh, location and and the uh, prevalence of location as a, as a po as a as focal point uh, is that it's more concrete <laughs> than than some other focal points. Um, in principle, you can coordinate around any number of things. Random divination appears to be uh, 
and, and you know the use of particular methods and you know people seems to be common even within tribes. Uh, so the key mechanism here are sort of, as I see it, are uh, groups, subgroups that gain from coordinating their activities, have a reason to be in conflict, however, much of the time. So there, there are gains and there are losses. Uh, rather than thinking of it as a pure coordination gain, you get something more like battle of sexes or prisoner's dilemma situations. Uh, this happens all the time because there always are winners and losers in any kind of political decision. Location makes it really clear and easy. It's a natural way in which people divide themselves. And so I expect to see this more clearly in you know, location-based systems and religions. But you no, know, I think that, and, in my and, and some of the examples I use suggest that, that uh, it shouldn't be limited to that. Um, it's just a lot harder to identify and put bounds around the relevant power groups otherwise. Is that a meaningful answer? Yeah. You done? What, when we take a break, we're gonna we need a few minutes break and then uh, we'll reconvene. Thank you very much. Thank you. People used to talk about uh, America.